Hello, I'm Krista Dennett, Pelvic Floor Exercise Specialist, and I'm really excited to bring to you my very first interview here on my brand new YouTube channel with my new friend and new colleague, Trista Zinn. Trista is the founder of Hypopressives Canada. The reason why I wanted her on here for my first interview is for two reasons. One, because I recently did my Hypopressives level one certification with her. So I wanted her on here to help explain to everyone what hypopressives is. But more importantly, when I was doing the course with her, she shared with us her emotional experience of when she first discovered that she had a bladder prolapse. And I know that many of you may be able to resonate with the emotional piece. It doesn't have to necessarily be with a bladder prolapse, but it could be with some other situation with your body or pelvic floor dysfunction, and you feel lost and you don't know where to go to get the answers. So Trista's gonna share with her, you how she felt and what she did. And one of the journeys that she took was to find hypopressives. So she's gonna talk about that in our interview. Now, before we get started in this interview, I will tell you that I'm not hugely technically savvy yet in these interviews, so I didn't really film this correctly, but it's still great, and I'm really excited to be sharing it with you. So without further ado, here is my interview with Trista Zinn. Welcome everyone, my name is Krista Dennett and I am a pelvic floor exercise specialist. And today I'm really excited to have my first guest on my YouTube channel. This is Trista Zinn. And I met Trista because I recently did a hypopressive training with her for level one. And um, we'll get into that shortly. But the reason I wanted to bring Trista on um, is because of her story with respect to pelvic floor dysfunction. So Trista is a founder of Hypopressives Canada, and like we said, we'll talk about that shortly. And she also has Core Set Fitness in Toronto. So her and I are on opposite sides of the country of Canada. So I'm in Vancouver and she's in Toronto. So kind of exciting that we've been able to virtually connect, virtually do a course together, and now we're virtually talking here on YouTube and to all of you. So thank you, Trista, for coming on to my channel today and to be here to share your experience. Specifically, we're going to be talking about your pelvic floor dysfunction. And my goal here is to shed some light on the emotional side of pelvic floor dysfunction uh, so that people don't feel alone in the emotional side and to tell your story of what you did to help yourself heal from your dysfunction. So I'm going to get you to start by introducing yourself and maybe what you're doing what you do right now and then we'll go backwards in time into the time when you were going through your postpartum journey. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm happy to be able to shed some light on my experience with my personal journey with uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, I am 50. I do have a 19 year old and a 14 year old so I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. I am passionate about everything fitness and outdoors. So I'm a runner, a cross country skier, a cyclist, just to give you a little bit of a feel for what I like to do. Um, I've been in the fitness industry for, well, probably close to 27, 28 years. So personal trainer was my background. And I found out uh, that I had stage two cystocele, which was prolapse of the bladder um, when I was 42. So my oldest was 12, my youngest was just turning seven. So they weren't babes, I wasn't a new, new mom. Mm -hmm. um, and it was certainly an emotional journey, that's for sure. Uh, I had, how did I even find out about prolapse? I guess I found out about, about prolapse before I found out that I had it. Um, I had taken a Pilates, pelvic floor Pilates training course that a friend of mine had, uh, prompted me to take. And so I took this course and at this course, I found out what pelvic organ prolapse even was. Uh, the course also covered incontinence, both of which I did not have symptoms of uh, that I knew. And I have to tell you, the course was a bit of a shock, a bit of a slap in the face um, when I was learning about pelvic organ prolapse for the first time. And uh, I was kind of you know, how was it that I was a woman 42 years old with two kids in the fitness industry, uh, leading a healthy lifestyle and thinking I knew everything 
that I needed to know about moving forward in a positive direction with regards to my health and found out um, that this even existed. Uh, the other thing I found out at this course was about pelvic floor PTs, physiotherapists, something else. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even know that existed, a pelvic floor physio. So I left the course in a bit of a whirlwind, started talking to the moms in the neighborhood where my kids were going to school and addressing more and chatting a little bit more about the incontinence piece because the prolapse part was so foreign to me and I just seen them on the big screens in this course and I, I couldn't really wrap my head around that whole concept. Um, and I started recommending my clients. I was a personal trainer. I had a lot of female clients, postnatal women, runners, older adults. Um, and I started to suggest that everyone should go and see a pelvic PT just to get a base mark like even if we can just treat it as an annual get a base mark let's see where we're at so as a personal trainer i didn't want to help progress something that maybe we didn't even know existed yeah yes uh, my metrics or whatever strength training routine they were doing and because i was sending everyone to go see a public floor pt and i believed it was important i also went to go see the public floor pt and it was at that appointment that i found out i actually had stage two cystocele, so the bladder. And I found out that the little hint of symptoms that I'd had prior, which was just like a little bit of a tugging up, I thought it was like high, high inner thigh, maybe adductor muscle that I kind of strained and it wasn't constant, but it you know, kind of happened every so often. Um, could be or could have been a symptom of this pelvic organ prolapse. But other than that, I didn't really have anything that I thought was attributing to it um, or the symptoms. And so when I found out that I had stage two uh, cystocele, I was devastated. I was an emotional wreck, to be honest. Um, I think there was two, two pieces to that. One was that also back then we were told to stop doing everything that we were doing, stop training, stop, don't run, don't do your strength training, stop doing all your ab workout, my site, everything. So anything that I would have done to help me emotionally cope with the fact that this was happening, I was told not to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I remember it was Mother's Day, if you want to know the exact day. <laughs> and my husband was on a business trip and the kids were really just driving me nuts. Like all I wanted to do is just be in my room and try to figure out what was going on and desperately not wanting to see it become those progressed stages that I'd heard about and seen about in this course. You had just seen what it actually could potentially look like. <laughs> yeah, because I was seeing stage threes and stage fours and um, it's a lot to take in. So you go through this emotional uh, cloud or journey, I guess, if you will, where there is a number of things. You go through anger, frustration. How was it no one told me about this? Especially when I had heard in the course that the percentage of women that have pelvic floor dysfunction is so high, even as they age. Like, why didn't anyone tell me? And of all those examinations that I'd taken at the doctor, no mention nothing yeah. so that I was really angry about that um, and uh, I felt again alone because it wasn't like a knee injury where I could just kind of go to my friends oh my god I'm not running anymore because I have a knee injury I couldn't just like spill my guts on the fact that my pelvic organs were like it's an intimate yeah. part of your body and I really wasn't comfortable with that. You also have to think about, uh, okay, like do I tell my husband or do I not tell my husband? Like, is this going to affect the intimacy of our relationship or not? Does he know? Would he know? Like, so that's another piece. As your mind is always going, I became like hyper aware and hyper focused on every single thing about my pelvic floor, worried that I was gonna progress it somehow. I couldn't walk down the street, I couldn't without thinking about it. I remember actually being at a street light and thinking like, you have to pay attention or you're gonna get hit by a car. Like I was so in my own world of what was going on. So you wanted to hit on the emotional piece. Yeah. I'm like, what's going on you here? But anyway, on the emotional piece. <laughs> Anyway, you go through this stage, there is anger. So there is the anger part, the upset, 
I was angry at the fitness industry. Um, could this have been something that I had progressed myself because of the training that I was doing? Uh, maybe my body wasn't ready for it and I was starting into things too quickly without knowing. Um, I remember lying in bed with my son after reading him a book and he was falling asleep and thinking like, okay, it's just a prolapse. It's not the kids. It's not, you know, cancer or something. You can live through this. You know, like I needed to take a breath and kind of redirect, right? Like start redirecting my thinking. And because otherwise you can sit in it for a long, long time. And I'd kind of done that stage. I was done with that, the crying stage. I was done with that. I was at the point where I had to start turning things around. How long do you, would you say you were going through this emotional piece? And, um, and also, was there anywhere that you could go to look for information on it other than, I'm assuming, you had gone to the pelvic floor physical therapy. So that's mm -hmm. who is the one that let you know about it. Um, and then what, what was out there? Cause we're talking about, and there's a couple of things I wanted to just maybe mention before we continue on with yep. where your thought went to and what you did do. Um, the first thing is, is you, you didn't have these symptoms till later on. Like you're talking like what you said about 11 years plus postpartum. Yep. And um, which, potentially means that these symptoms could have been there. The start of that prolapse could have been there since day one. But if we're not informed that something like that could potentially exist after having babies, and we're not in told that we have a mild even prolapse because we don't have symptoms, then we just carry on life without knowing and potentially aggravating it even more, which it, in your case, I've seen that quite often. And the other thing I wanted to just clarify for people that with respect to prolapse, they do grade them. Um, and the stage that you're talking about is um, where it's pushing into the vaginal wall and starting to descend. You started to notice symptoms, but you weren't even sure what it was. Yeah. So, and I think, I think too, the symptoms vary so much from one person to the next, because one person can have a stage one and very bothered by it. Absolutely. Or someone else can have a stage two or a stage three and not really know, right? Um, so and there is multiple prolapse. You can have a stage one cystocele and rectocele at the same time. I see that quite often. And some people are extremely aggravated by it. Um, intercourse is extremely painful and other people don't even notice it. But at this same time, regardless of symptoms or no symptoms, I feel like we need to know that A, this can happen with pregnancy and birth. Yeah. B, that we should get checked. And if there is a start of a prolapse, then we should be informed because then we can make choices on what we're going to do about it. But then there's the emotional piece like you're talking about. And I think back when you and I were having babies, there was certainly not enough information out there. And a lot of people would become fearful and upset and angry, just like you did. And that's still happening today because there's still not enough information out here, out here to let us know that it's okay. This is something that you can work through and that you can no longer be impacted by. Um, and that's the important message that we need to share with women. Yeah. You, you don't have to let it uh, rule your life. No. Right. Like there, there was the point where I was like, okay, you know what, you got to pull yourself together because this is not going to determine what you can and can't do. Yeah. And I started to slowly start training a bit again and just feeling how things were going. But I, this was not going to yeah, rule me. No. Right. And so, you know, that's the thing is a lot of people need to know that this, they, they do have to take matters in their own hands. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the way it is. And as you and I both know, there's no quick fix to pretty much any pelvic floor dysfunction situation. Um, but there are tools and strategies available to become symptom free. And that's the key. And that was what you did is, and I was, had asked you like how, how long do you think you were kind of in this sort of like state of what do I do now? And then what did you do to try to find sources for help for yourself? Um, how long was I in the state? The one thing that's a little bit uh, 
because I wasn't doing what I do now, I wasn't documenting everything, right? Like if I had been in that industry, I would have been like, okay, time marking. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to say a couple of weeks, like it was a couple of weeks before I'd found out about this hypopressive technique. Um, I had, uh, Sherry Palm was someone who would answer emails for me and was helping me a little bit with the emotional piece. Mm -hmm. um, Kim had heard about this hypopressive uh, technique and I started Googling it and finding it on YouTube. And so these were, your, these were the, your sort of connections and colleagues at the time in the fitness industry um, that you had were communicating with is to find out what to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or doing what many people do is searching online to try and figure out what there is. And I was told really surgery is going to be the only option later on. You know, I want to comment on the fact that I think the pelvic health physio world is changing so much also from back then. And I don't think Absolutely. they're selling that to their clients anymore with a stage two. Hopefully people watch this video and then they can see that they, A, they're not alone in how they feel emotionally about it. And that B, they've got to like stand up and be an advocate for themselves and, you know, find the best fit of a strategy that they can do to heal. And I wanted to find out your journey into how you found out about hypopressives and then tell us a little bit about hypopressives and how it helps for not just prolapse, but other common pelvic floor dysfunction symptoms. So it was on YouTube. There was YouTube. There wasn't anything in English at the time. It was all Spanish, predominantly Spanish. Kaiza in Banyoles, Spain, she was Spanish speaking, but an English instructor who would become now a master trainer and a course instructor. And so, I mean, I had started emulating what I saw on YouTube, which I don't really uh, think is the best idea, actually, because I've seen it done really wrong and uh, cued incorrectly or not how we cue it yeah um but for some reason i connected with it and within a couple of weeks my stage two had gone up to a stage one and the pelvic floor physio couldn't believe it my pelvic floor tone was normalizing and i could feel there was a difference yeah. from being yeah i'm just gonna put a little like side note here for people that you're right like especially now that i've done the training for hypopressives um, unless you are somebody like yourself, a fitness professional who is very uh, mind body aware, very aware of your alignment, very aware of the function of your body from um, an exercise and movement perspective, it could be something that could be done wrong. So having your success by just watching YouTube videos is not necessarily the case for everybody else, but it goes to show that just doing it for when you do it correctly for two weeks you already had that much of a difference yes the people respond to it differently some respond to it quicker than others mm -hmm. and it had gone from a two to a one and that's when i was kind of like oh my god i have to figure out where i can learn this properly and i really wanted to bring it to canada or north america because even if there was a certain percentage of the population that was going to respond the way i was responding to it how can i not bring it here mm -hmm. so that's when I started uh, connecting with Kaiza and I went to Spain. She taught me the English level one privately. It had actually only been taught once before that. So really it was just entering the English stream at that time. And how long ago was this? That was in 2012. Okay. Yeah. And now it had been in Europe in Spanish speaking countries for close to 30 years. It just hadn't hit the English speaking countries yet. Um, and so she happened to be English speaking, got herself to the point where she's master trainer, then team teach courses. And so I took that course privately, came back, did what I was supposed to do. Like now I knew the poses, the details to the poses, et cetera, and the importance of the poses along with this unique breathing pattern. Again, within a couple of weeks, I went back to the pelvic health physio and the prolapse was gone. And she couldn't believe it. I remember her being like, oh my God, I'm on my knees. Like I see nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> so that's what kind of started this whirlwind of travel back and forth to Spain because really how was I going to help as many people as I could? I couldn't just teach everyone, all clients. I needed to have more fitness and health professionals take the courses so they can use it as a tool uh, with their clients or patients. And 
I really like to say that is it is a tool. It's a tool that's been effective for many, many people. There are other tools that are out there that also work really well and women get great results with. So I'm not saying this is the only thing. It happened to be my miracle for me. I know it's helped many, many of my clients and many other women and men around the world, but I think it's important to choose what resonates with you. And maybe it's the missing key to your journey, mm -hmm. right? Your public health journey. Oh, exactly. So um, with respect to, it is a tool for sure. Um, there's nobody out there in the exercise rehab or fitness profession should ever deem that their program is the solution because everybody's body's different. Everybody's ability to connect with their body is different. So we need to look at things as a strategy and you can choose a strategy that works best for you. So the avenue that I've been doing for the last six years is the you know, movement piece, is getting the pelvic floor muscle to lengthen and shorten with movement and breath. And um, so that has a very sort of different avenue to it than the hypopressive. So could you explain what exactly is hypopressives and how would if somebody were to do the hypopressives, what would that entail? So hypopressives is a postural and respiratory technique that essentially takes a full body approach to core and pelvic health. When we're looking at the core, we're talking respiratory diaphragm, we're talking pelvic diaphragm or pelvic floor, we're talking transverse abdominals, the deepest abdominal wall multifidus, the muscle along the spine. And so that canister. And you, that canister is supposed to work in an automatic anticipatory way without us having to think about it all the time. That's what the muscles are there for. They're for function, resting tone, um, to act in this automatic anticipatory way. And they're to act together as a unit, right? Synergistically. So it's kind of like, hmm how do we train a group of muscles to work as a group in an automatic anticipatory way? Well, you have to see what influences this core. And so this exercise technique creates this automatic reaction within the core. Again, it's a full body approach because you can't just train those muscles one at a time. You have to train them together and everything from head to toe to the fingertips affects what's happening. Uh, somewhere else in the body, including the core. So it's very much a postural and respiratory exercise program that there are stages, progressions, where you move from static postures to more dynamic postures to where we're adding more asymmetry to the movements. And then in the level three, then we start to add uh, asymmetry rotations. We're starting to do the breath holds for a little bit longer. When we're talking about it is it taking into consideration what's happening with the entire body. Um, from my understanding in doing it is that um, we're looking at the alignment, not just of what's going on from here to here, what's going on from here down to the toes, into the fingertips and creating that environment so that when you are focusing on the breath, you're getting the ribs to move again. Because I find that, especially one of the things that I really loved about doing the hypopressives course is that it gave me new tools to help cue the breath on where I really want it to be. Um, because what happens with our breathing, you know, as we see most people are shallow breathing, it's just life gets away and it creates a shallow breath. Ribs get stuck and they don't move. And when we want to redirect, we redirect into the belly, but I see people just pushing that belly out. So this was a really great tool to not only have as obviously to deal with things like prolapse, but also to um, have some new ways to get people into alignment in and the cues you used were so simple and working on the breathing. And even in the short period of time that I've just introduced alignment and breath with the new cues, I'm seeing the type of movement in the ribs that I want. I'm seeing the type of breathing that I'm wanting and they're feeling like they're flowing more. They're getting a nice deep diaphragmatic breath that improves the oxygen capacity. And then of course, as you said, it works on helping that natural function of that inner canister, um, that core team of muscles. And then the other thing that I was gonna ask you was with hypopressives, we do what's called a false breath or an apnea. 
So maybe mm -hmm. tell people about what that is and what the purpose is behind it with the hypopressive strategy. Sure. So this false inhale, first we do these three rest breaths as a beginner where you're simply inhaling and exhaling. And bear in mind, we've already optimized this as the trainer. We've taken a look at the client and we've optimized this piece first. And then we introduce this apnea or vacuum breath or false inhale, however you'd like to, to cue it, depending on the person. Um, so we do our third and last inhalation our third and last exhale, we do not push everything out, nor do we do it with a final push. We simply exhale, we lengthen and grow as we cue the growing. And just at that point where you're about to go to take a breath, you instead close at the mouth and close at the throat and you go to mimic taking a breath, you just don't allow any air in. And you open the rib cage the same way you did when you were breathing just no air goes in and we create this vacuum effect where everything gets drawn inwards and upwards and we decongest the pelvic cavity and everything glides inwards and upwards. We help to release the diaphragm. And of course the alignment is also very important in the postures and poses to this breath hold because it can also help amplify and maintain the results that we get with this false inhale there's so much to it. Like the false inhale creates this great myofascial release. It's excellent for scar tissue. This exercise technique is far more than a technique uh, solely for pelvic health or pelvic dysfunction, because really, if you're looking at the core, you have to look at what the core's function is. And the core's function is digestion, circulation, speech, continence, whether it's fecal incontinence or urinary continence, right? To maintain those sexual function. It's to uh, prevent abdominal hernias. It's to, right? So we're helping to balance and counterbalance the pressure within that canister. And if there's a weak link somewhere, it's going to give. And the pelvic floor dysfunction piece, that just so happens to be where their weak link is. But for someone else, it could be the abdominal wall where they're showing abdominal hernia or vertebral hernia, or something else is going wrong, and digestive issues, perhaps, constipation, these sorts of things where that whole system isn't getting the movement that it needs. It can help for more people, men and women, than just those with pelvic floor dysfunction. But that, that's what the false inhale is. You hold that breath and you're holding everything in this drawn inwards and upwards position for what you can. When you need to take your breath, you simply open the airway and you allow the air to enter. You maintain these postures and poses while you're doing this breath hold. If you're someone who's very well trained or has a trained eye, the person who's doing this breath hold, if they have clothes on, you should basically not even be able to tell they just did this false inhale. It is not a false gulp of air, right? So it's not a quick inwards and upwards movement. We're you not- Your face going like- Yeah, like not like <laughs> for us holding the breath. We didn't activate anything from the abdominal wall. We're just allowing things to get drawn inwards and upwards. We're maintaining these specific postures and poses, which again, why are the postures and poses so important too? Because if you just did this breathing piece, where yeah, you decongest the pelvic cavity, the organs can start to go up. We're starting to improve the tone. So we're working more of the tonic muscle fibers, not the type two phasic ones that are more built for strength. So it's more of the tonic ones that we're um, focusing on, which is predominantly, which predominantly make up the core and the pelvic floor. So we're improving the resting tone and the function of the core. Well, yeah. that was something that I was going to point out when I did it is that this isn't like a passive relaxing breathing you actually get stimulated from it like I felt like my whole body just woke up when I finished doing um, just the level one pattern of movement you know and then we sh even through the blurriness of taking a picture through a computer you could see the amount of just change of tone that even I had in my whole abdominal area from going through a weekend just working on it. It was crazy. <laughs> crazy. Of crazy. All, the, all the years I've been in the fitness industry, never did I get results like this with clients yeah. so fast. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Um, it was wild. I mean, like, and I'll, um, I think I have the before and afters. I'll throw them in this video too. You can just have a quick look, but 
it, um, yeah, it was quite interesting. So what people need to know if they are going to look at doing a hypopressive type program, it is best to find somebody who is trained in doing the um, exercises and the postures and breath and teaching you accordingly. Uh, because if it, like you said, if it done, is done wrong, you could potentially, like what we're trying to create is a reduced pressure in the abdominal cavity. If it's done wrong, you could potentially creating more pressure in the abdominal cavity. So you wanna make sure that you're working with someone that is trained to teach you correctly how to do the hypopressive technique. And also that it is a stimulant. So you're not gonna do it before bed. You're not gonna do it after you've eaten. Um, and it's a supportive tool for you know, anything else you want to do. And we talked about, you and I have talked about this privately is that some people do it as a couple of poses before a strength training routine or before a run. And, and then of course, doing a few after a workout as well, just to sort of realign that, you know, whole uh, system of that could potentially be disrupted when we go and do more higher demands on the body, like running or weightlifting or those kind of things. Just like everything else when it comes to exercise rehab for pelvic floor issues, this isn't something that, and this again, you and I've talked about privately, it's not something that you have to like obsessively do and you have to set aside an hour every day for the rest of your life. Once you've gotten into the stage where you're now healing and you can look at maintenance, then these are just, it's another tool you just as a little maintenance strategy that you could do every day, every other day for a few minutes here and there. And that's yeah. something that I think is people should be aware of. It's not a life of always doing exercise rehab, whatever it is. <laughs> no, and, and the thing also that's important too is the your perspective around it and around the technique that you're using. So hypopressives, they might have started this exercise program for pelvic because they had pelvic floor dysfunction. You can think like, oh my God, I have to do my pelvic floor exercises again. I have to do these all the time. I mean, when I started doing them, I thought, oh my God, if this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life to help maintain this core function and optimize my pelvic health, I am sold. Like this is, it's, if you're going to do the whole thing, it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes. All you need is a floor. That's it. Yep. Nothing. And do you have to always do the 15 to 20 minutes? No, we can have someone who does 15 to 20 minutes. Like, okay, those are my hypopressive days, like two or three times a week. Maybe that's all they need. Someone else might do a couple of poses in the morning. That's what, like five minutes, 10 minutes. Someone else does them to complement their workout. Like you said, it's their cool down or it's their ab workout or their postural piece. With regards to all the postures and the poses, they're put in place for a specific reason. And a lot of times I find people get so hooked up on this eye candy YouTube of this vacuum component, right? Of this false inhale, because it's kind of weird. And that's, but you have to understand that it's way more than that. Like you can just do that and you can kind of get results. But if you want something that's going to be longer lasting and help you through your daily activities, you have to look at the alignment. That's why you just do Kegels. You can do Kegels till you're blue in the face. But if you're not addressing how the person's breathing and you're not addressing how they're aligned, then there's going to be constant pressure toward the pelvic floor. They're going to have to do that specific Kegel exercise forever, maybe more than they would need to if they were addressing the big picture. So we really have to step back, look at the big picture. What are the muscles there for? right? Is it a quad that we're working or is it our pelvic floor that we're working? Is it transverse abdominals that we're working or is it rectus abdominals that we're working? So we have to step back, take a look. What are they in the body for? What's their job? And let's train them so they can function optimally for what they're created for, if that makes sense. Yeah. With uh, thinking we need to keep going for strength, power, harder, faster, you know, it's not, not what this is about. I think when we're, when we're talking with core, we're not really, the core is the deepest part of something. If you're only working the external part, you're missing that piece. And I find even athletes who, I mean, if you got to kick that soccer ball across the field, get the basket, basketball in hockey, whatever, for sure, you're going to have to work the ab muscles more than maybe the mom who's going to be at the park with her kids and getting groceries, et cetera. Your training program is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But if you still don't respect that deep system, you are going to be on the sidelines with an injury. And a lot of times in men, it tends to be abdominal hernias. They can't manage that increase in pressure. Mm 
that they keep creating. And like I said earlier, it's got to go somewhere. It's same with the woman who keeps training and training. Where's your weak link? You will find out. <laughs> I'll end here with this, a good point to um, finish off with for people to understand that you, know, you could go through majority of your life without having any symptoms, but the pelvic floor and that inner core are naturally changing as we age, um, hormonal uh, changes impacted as well. It's in our best interest to be aware of the function of that inner core. I think that it is important that everybody be aware of the function of their inner core, their pelvic floor, how it relates to just even day-to-day -day functional life or in their training aspect of whatever exercise or athletic level they are at. So it's something that is really important to keep the message out there and spreading the words to women so that they don't end up 50, 60, 70, and all of a sudden have these problems creeping up on them. So hypopressives is another fantastic strategy or tool in the toolbox to use to help with addressing not just prolapse, as we've talked about, but multiple pelvic floor dysfunction from incontinence, um, diastasis recti, and so on. But of course, as you mentioned, um, it has a whole other benefit to it on things we wouldn't have even thought about. So that's fantastic. So I'm going to put the link to um, Trista's uh, website. If you are a fitness professional and you're looking to add hypopressive technique as one of your tools for working with clients, we did the course virtually because of course we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. And I thought it was really well done virtually. I mean, obviously being in person is nice touch if we can, but I still learned this technique through the way we're working right now and talking right now. And that was fantastic. And I highly recommend it for anyone who is a fitness professional. It is our responsibility to at the very least understand that inner core function and how it relates to, um, and how, what we have to consider in exercise and movement with our inner core. So that's something that's super important. And at this point, I'm not sure if you have anything more, Trista, that you wanted to add with respect to, maybe we missed on something. I think you did a great job in sharing that emotional piece. I know there's a lot of women that could relate to that. And hopefully that anybody is struggling to just don't fear, don't fear the results when you find out you have a dysfunction. And then just know that there's people like Trista and myself and there's pelvic floor physical therapists. There are people out there that you can talk to that you can get help yeah, and I, I think that if I was gonna if I was gonna sum anything up or if there was a last couple of words that I would say, I'd say, you know, it's definitely a journey. You'll learn a lot about yourself for sure through this journey, but be patient. Be patient with yourself. I think we can be so hard on ourselves talking, why aren't we better faster? We should be over this, why me, all this sort of things. And I think if we talk to ourselves and give ourselves the same kind guidance that we would give a friend. If a friend came to us with the same problem, then yeah, I think you'll be able to go through this a little bit easier. Don't rush. See what program resonates with you the best. This was what worked for me. There are other tools out there and maybe hypopressives will become something that you do down the road after you've experienced something else. Or maybe you use it as a stepping stone for another um, approach. But yeah, be, be kind and be patient to yourself. That's how I would end my, yeah, my final notes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming onto my YouTube channel here and sharing your story and explaining what hypopressives is because this is a new technique for me that I am really excited to be now implementing with clients and, and having it as another tool in my toolbox as a pelvic floor exercise rehab specialist so that I can continue to grow and learn on the many ways that we can help women when they are facing these life altering situations. So thank you, Trista. And again, our links are in the comments below on how you can get in touch with Trista if you have any questions about hypopressives. All right, everyone, thank you for watching.